I wasn't in pain. Nobody was like stabbing me to do it throughout all this stuff, right? It's a weird experience, life experience not everybody has, but like, you know, it takes the special operations stuff out of it. It was, it's uncomfortable, right? But feeling that uncomfortableness and the ability to sustain that feeling of being uncomfortable while you're becoming the person who can earn more and keep more is what allowed me to have success later in life. Will and Jim here with another beautiful day in our country, and today we're going to cover what surprises most people, and that's when you look at the numbers and data, is what you're making in terms of income common or uncommon? And you'll want to stay to the end of the day because not only will you be able to learn kind of how to assess how you're doing with earning money in your current situation compared to the rest of the country based on the data, but Jim and I are also going to share for each level of income what our next steps were that we took to put ourselves in the best possible position where we're able to move up to the next level and even the next couple of levels of wealth creation for us and our family, which really, when you think about it, is the power of America, which is anybody can move up those levels with a little bit of hard work, discipline, and intelligence and become a wealth creator who creates a financial legacy for them and their families. And so, Jim, tell us a little bit about the data and common or uncommon income coming in for somebody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so the big question here is, is your income common in America or uncommon in America? And so there's roughly 140 million tax returns filed every year in the country. And this is the data from the IRS. And so what we're going to cover today So think about this in terms of as we're going through this, what does your household have to earn every year to be in the top 50% of those tax returns? So we're going to kind of break it up into 50% and above 50% and kind of below and then the common income and then the uncommon, you know, uh, income, right? So let's talk about this uh, a little bit. Let's just dive right into the numbers here. So we'll... What's amazing is, is to be in the top 50% of adjusted gross income households, what the family has to earn in a calendar year to be in that top 50%. I already well, know before, that you know this. Before you reveal it, Jim, before you reveal it, yeah, okay. if you're All listening right. right now, take a second to think about it. So top 50%, meaning half the country is below this, half the country is above this. Take a second in your minds, maybe even say it out loud. What do you think that number is? What do you think that number is to be 50% or above, 50% or below? All right, Jim, drum roll. What is it? It might might shock you. I don't know. I know it did for me, but here it is. It's $42,184 a year. Combined income for the household, the, the AGI, adjusted gross income. Man, that's so much lower. I remember hearing that number for the first time and going, that can't be right. For the household, that's the number? Even when I was making below that in the military, <laughs> military, as we all know, doesn't pay great. I like I remember, you know, hearing that number not too long after I got out and going, "No way, that can't be, can't be possible." And Jim, I, you know, how long ago was how long ago was it for you where you were making that or below? Man, I mean, I can remember making five dollars and sixty three cents an hour, so that will really, really date me. But I can remember being so happy about it. And uh, I remember getting my first paycheck and realizing that I had a partner in my paycheck. And that was the biggest shock for me is that when I realized that, hey, I'm, I think I'm making all this money and then you know, I get to the paycheck and then I have a take home you know, that was different. But I can remember making you know, $250 a week working full time and, uh, and being super happy you know, about it. So, but I also remember at that time, I was thinking about it for me, Will, like, what has to happen in order to get more? And, then that, and that was a quick thing for me is like, you know, and I can remember at 14, I was, when I was making that money, I was uh, in landscaping at the time, working for my uncle's company. And I remember asking him like, hey, what has to happen in order for me to take on more responsibility for me to, to, to get more? And that began that trigger you know, for me all the way up to my next job, um, actually going back to work. Uh, this is something I, I don't know if you know or not, But uh, I had the opportunity to actually go work at the Albersons um, that I shared the peanut butter story on uh, and actually work for Bill. And um, so out of my very first paycheck, 
I was able to uh, give money uh, to Bill or you know back to the store uh, for that peanut butter, and we shared a, a laugh and, and a hug about it. But I can remember at that moment in time when he hired me, I was making six ten an hour, and I was so happy, you know. So it, pretty pretty amazing. I don't know what what about for you? Yeah, what man. I mean, it's kind of interesting, right? So you look at this and like, you know, I think I was, I was definitely making less than that as a teenager, but even in the military, right? Like military is not known for paying great, as we all probably know. Um, and if you didn't, spoiler alert, you know, military doesn't pay that much. And so I didn't make that much money until, you know, in my late 20s, where I was definitely above that or mid 20s, I guess. And so during that time, let's talk about, you know, here, here's what I avoided. Right? Because even not making a ton of money, I still saved money. And so what I always avoided inside of that was really spending too much. I always kept my expenses under control. Mainly, I was focused on the necessities, right? Food, had a vehicle, you know, some gas, some insurance, all that stuff. And then had a little fun out with the guys as, as you do to blow off steam with a really hard job. But the, I, and I recognize this in everybody else, right? Like you'd see the guys in the military and it's notorious. If anybody's ever been to a military town, you'll see all these Dodge Chargers running around and all these Jeeps and all this stuff. And it's, this cars cost more than they make it a year. And so I watched all these guys financing these cars at like 28% loans and all this loan sharky type stuff. And I just remember thinking at the time, like that car is kind of cool. However, no way, man. Absolutely no way am I going to be able to pay for that. How are they? And it turns out they weren't. They were just going further into debt. And so the actions I took was I put in the work to really, you know, kind of, you know, at that time, I was still going to school. I was developing my skills and my experience so that way I could become more valuable in the marketplace. I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in the military long term or if maybe I was going to transition out or any of that stuff. Um, and occasionally I even hustled on the side just, you know, doing side jobs, stuff like that. If I was back home from deployments or if I was trying to do stuff where I could try to earn money because I just recognized like you got two options. You can either hustle, do more, you know, basically work more hours in whatever capacity that is. Military doesn't really have overtime. So like that's not a thing. So I worked, tried to do stuff on the side and teach martial arts and do all these things. So you could hustle and do things that bring in money or you could focus on building skills and experience so you could earn more later on. And so at that point in time, I just decided to do both. But I recognized like, man, that was a long-term goal. Like I wasn't getting out, of, I still had like two years left on my military contract. And I think that was before I even kept going, right? And so I was pretty committed to a longer, you know, I was like, yeah, it's gonna be two to four years before this really pays off, except for kind of the side gigs hustling, you know, doing personal lessons. And I had to get really comfortable being uncomfortable. Because for me, I wasn't where I wanted to be in terms of earning what I wanted to have and building up my wealth, so I had a cushion. Well, so what was required for me back then was the discomfort of choosing short-term sacrifice for long-term gains. Like, I was doing a really hard job. I was working crazy hours. Like, and then taking on you know shifts, trying to train martial arts or CrossFit or all this stuff to just try to bring in a little bit of extra money. And so like, that takes time. So if you, for me, the character trait that was required was being comfortable, being uncomfortable, because I wasn't where I wanted to be. And so whether you end up hustling a little bit, like I did to make a little bit of money on the side, or also like I did going to school where, you know, you're a little uncomfortable. I wasn't in pain. Nobody was like stabbing me to do it throughout all this stuff, right? It's a weird experience, life experience not everybody has, but like, um, you know, it takes the special operations stuff out of it. It was, it's uncomfortable. Right, but feeling that uncomfortableness and the ability to sustain that feeling of being uncomfortable while you're becoming the person who can earn more and keep more is what allowed me to have success later in life. And so while all my buddies were buying crazy cars and Jeeps and all this stuff, you know, for years, in fact, even when I had the gym, um, which was my first business series of gyms and kind of you know, built those up pretty big and I started making money into the next level, which we'll talk about, I still drove a 2010 Pontiac Vibe with a crack in the windshield. And I had plenty of money. I could have bought something else. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't matter, man. It was like it was good on gas. It was reliable. It did everything I needed to. Insurance was cheap. And it allowed me to have an excess of cash, right? So I had more cash flow or more, uh, you know, without getting super nerdy, you know, savings <laughs> ratios. Some were obviously very familiar with. But after my expenses in my life, 
And after what I was making, I had more than enough money to save, which allowed me to get forward, you know, get a little bit ahead a little bit faster. And that's what brought me a lot of comfort and certainty back then. And so, Jim, that was kind of my, you know, experience with when I was earning that. Tell us a little bit about the next level. That was the top 50%. Talk to us about the top 25% and what the data says. Yeah. So be in the top 25% of adjusted household incomes in America today, the household has to be earning $85,653. So that's the top 25%. So when I first saw that, I, I, I put that number actually a little bit higher, but I was pretty, uh, pretty shocked, you know, at that, uh, at that number uh, as well. Um, and I can remember, you know, reaching, you know, that level. It's funny. I remember, you know, making five dollars and sixty three cents and then six ten and then eight you know thirty five and all these different ones and I can remember thinking to myself, man, well if I can only get to ten bucks an hour, life is gonna be amazing. Right? And then what ends up happening is you get to ten, you want fifteen and then fifteen and twenty. And then you get to that point where you set that horizon, for me anyway, at that uh, you know six figure range. So I can remember it getting really real close uh, and being, you know, in the in the eighty five thousand range for me and just sort of still learning the balance between saving for tomorrow, you know, I think for me, my, my perspective was, is I was, I'm always still, even to this day, more fearful of not having enough mm -hmm. because I grew up with so little, right? And, and I grew up without. And so I'm always been a little bit like more cautious of not just paycheck to paycheck, but having a month or two always, you know, in cushion because you just, you know, for me, you, you just never know. But I just remember this progression for me as we're moving up and going over common and uncommon. I just always remember my focus being on um, more and the next, you know, the next level of what it is that I need to do. I don't think I really started focusing on saving beyond the survival mode um, probably till I was actually making, you know, more than 85,000. I think it was right there as I actually started paying attention to it um, and thinking beyond survival of like, you know, uh, even, you know, a little bit more. But talk to I us mean, a little bit about, about, what about if, you? If, you, if you would, Jim, talk to us a little bit about yeah. how you got there, right? What was the character traits for you that allowed you to move from thinking $10 was feeling like you had arrived into moving, you know, up above that top 25%, which is that 85,000 you know, 86,000 range right in there. Yeah, I just, I've always had this, this burning desire of uh, more, that there's just more, there's just more out there. There's more opportunity. Um, and so, because I've always believed, you know, from, you know, Bill's advice and just the way life has worked for me personally, is that um, I'm gonna have to work a little bit harder. I'm gonna have to get more skills. I'm gonna have to become smarter. I'm gonna have to become more valuable. Um, if I'm working for somebody else, which I got my first lessons, you know, in, in landscaping, becoming the employee and then becoming a, um, a team lead and then ultimately running six or seven crews. Um, I just always been lucky and blessed, I should say, where I've had this desire to, uh, what's next? What's next? And usually what next is a, a different fight. It's a different challenge. It's a different decision. But uh, I just knew that I, it, it was going to be more, you know, more for me. So I got a little taste of five dollars and sixty three cents, and then I got a little taste of eight. So hey, what would twenty five dollars an hour look like? So I've just always been aware, you know, of that, uh, of that, uh, you know, mindset. Will. Yeah, and I think there's something interesting because I, rem I remember when I moved past this, and I kind of hit that as well. You know, I remember there were some friends that I had. So my business trajectory was, you know, started relatively quick and did okay. And then hit like right below this actually for take home pay for me. And then from there, it took me about another year and a half of really working really hard, figuring out things, you know, like I talked about in the previous one, building those character traits, that skill set, so I could become the person that could earn more. Right. And as I built that up, as I brought more value to the marketplace where, you know, the business grew and because we were helping our clients. And so it kept growing and growing and growing and doing all that stuff. I remember looking at friends that I had that were already past where I was. And they were making, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year, right around there. And I watched their spending catch up. And they kind of felt like they, at least my perception of them, it seemed like they felt like they had arrived. And I watched them kind of forget the discipline and the actions that it took that got them there. They just kind of let it go. And I watched them get in real trouble. And years later, they were really struggling. So they had a couple of really good years. And they had way more years where they struggled. And I didn't want that to happen. And so I really kind of internalized it and made sure that I never felt like I arrived. 
I never forgot the discipline, the actions that it took me to get there. And what I did is I, I really had, I remember thinking this specifically, Jim, I was like, all right, cool. I have definitely have an excess of money. I think I was living off less than 50% of what I was making at the time. Right. And I, I, <laughs> wow, I like that That's ratio. You know, I was just yeah. living, living humbly cause I enjoyed what I was doing, you know, I, yeah. but I also had some things in there. And so were, that weren't working and that were frustrating, right? Like I had a computer that was like this little netbook piece of junk that didn't work that well. And so I remember at the time I was like, you know what? This is silly. I have w plenty of money saved up. I shouldn't do what I watched my father do where he had plenty of money saved up, but he would still buy an $800 car and just keep fixing at it and swearing at it and <laughs> busting his knuckles on it. And I watched him do that his whole life. I was like, I'm going to buy something that's reliable, that's quality, or brings a really good experience for me and the people around me that I care about. And so that's where I started spending the money. It was things that actually brought real value into my life. And I would take a little bit of time and I would go, well, does this purchase make sense for me? And I remember the first time I got a MacBook, I was like, this thing just works. This thing's awesome, right? It's way yeah. more expensive than the crappy little netbook that I had. But man, the thing just worked. And I think that was the yeah. biggest thing for me as I really looked at things, as I looked at purchases, Quality. like, will this bring value? Yeah. Right. And I had that muscle set aside of, I think eventually that 50% started going down because I, you know, you move out of just a, you know, junk apartment and all that stuff. And you start to get something that's like just relatively livable. Uh, yeah. But I had that muscle built of I was always setting aside for me. And this isn't, you know, but I didn't have kids at the time or any of that stuff. But for me, I was setting aside 30%, 30 to 40% of what I was making wow. so I could build my wealth for the long term. But that was a muscle I That's built awesome. up. And so yeah. for, cause I wanted to put myself in the best possible position to make sure that money stayed in my life. And so I knew I had to kind of understand these principles of wealth creation and have this kind of character traits. And for me, it was setting aside that money and then ultimately kind of working with somebody to create a wealth creation plan, all that stuff. But I got really intentional. I became a person that said, all right, well now I'm making money. I can just enjoy it, but I watched all my buddies that were making good money that were then struggling. I was like, ooh, that looks tough. And so I remember yeah, thinking to myself, pretty, like, pretty cool. oh, go ahead, man. No, that's awesome. I was just saying that, that's pretty cool because we're, we're talking about and what you're, what you're referencing is such a really cool you know, distinction. And I'm so glad that you're, you're sharing it because we're in, we're in obviously the uncommon you know, income territory right now in the country, right? And so we're talking about $85,000 a year. I mean, remember, 50% of the country and below is that at that 42,000 level. So early on, I mean, you have just done a, an incredible job of establishing those habits and, and that discipline at that level, which uh, is really cool. But also, I don't know if everyone else is picking up on this, but what I'm hearing is um, I'm kind of uncommon, you know, for, for a lot of people to be doing the things that you were doing at such a young age and at that income level, which I think is great. I wasn't that good. I, I, I don't think I figured it out until the next level. Um, again, I was in, in that survival mode. I wish that, you know, looking back on it, I could have you know been saving 50% of my income, but I mean, probably reality was I was saving just enough to, uh, to just convince myself that I was saving. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, awesome, a lot man. of it, uh, credit where credit's due. A lot of it goes back to my dad. I mean, I, uh, you know, if I bought anything, back then he would go, well, how much do you have saved up? And he knew, right? It was like a hundred dollars, like barely enough to get by. Cause he didn't pay for gas. He didn't pay for insurance. I had to buy my, I bought a crappy little truck off my uncle that was barely running. Uh, like that was, that was, you know, the first vehicle, but he didn't, he made the decision not to pay for anything. Right. Some of it was, I don't think he had the money, but the other thing was like, he wanted to instill that value in me. If you want something, you're going to have to earn it and plan for it. And so every time I would go to spend money on something that he felt wasn't a good purchase, which was everything for him, uh, <laughs> it was very much like, well, what are you going to do if the truck breaks down and you don't have a vehicle for two weeks? And I was pretty active in sports all that time. You know, he was working and, I, you know, it wasn't in the cards for my mom to pick me up, stuff like that. And so he's like, well, you're going to, how are you going to get back and forth? You're going to have to ask somebody. You're going to have to rely on somebody else to be able to provide for you. And so he had instilled all this stuff in me, which was good up to a point, but it held me back as well later, which we'll talk about in the next one. But, I, I, you know, it was interesting. The other thing that I saw 
at that level, especially like the hundred thousand dollar level, I think for some reason. I watched people's spending habits when they caught up. There was no end to it. And they would buy some cool stuff. Don't get me wrong, it was cool stuff. And like now I buy more cool stuff, but like I'll, I'll give you an example of this, right? So now I got gifted this in a long time ago, or a number of years ago now, from a really good friend, the founder of the company that I was then the CEO of. And so it's a very nice, bright lean watch, $10,000 watch and all that stuff. And he's a watch guy, right? Like he's into them. He looks at them like they're pieces of art. And they're 100%. And he's got this very, very nice Rolex that shows the time in multiple different places. And, you know, it's got the calendar. I forget what it's called and all that stuff. But he's explaining everything to me. And what I recognized is like, oh, that's normal for him. Like he will always have watches that are, you know, I think that was like a $40,000 watch for him, which I never would have bought this for me. I probably still wouldn't buy this watch for me. But it was whether it's suits or designer handbags or luxury cars or like penthouse apartments, any of that stuff. I watched people where they had a really hard time. As soon as they moved into it, it was awesome. It was new. And then all of a sudden you would hear somebody talk about like, yeah, and the, but there's this issue with it. And there was kind of this thing. I heard it enough because it was so weird to me. I was like, huh, that's strange. And over time, I kept hearing it and hearing it. What I realized was everything in terms of lifestyle normalizes. I'm sure, I mean, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm sure Bill Gates is rolling around in some super yacht, mega yacht, some 200-yard monstrosity that's out there floating in the ocean with every luxury possible going, man, I keep hitting my toe on this corner over here. Like, this is a great boat. I just wish that was changed. Like, I think everything normalizes after a certain point. So I really wanted to value the things that I had in my life. And I value experiences a little bit over things. And so I wanted to have nice stuff that worked and that I enjoyed, but I didn't want to overspend or overextend, even if I could still save 23%, if that meant that I had to fulfill that lifestyle to feel happy for the rest of my life. And I'm still that way a little bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, very cool. Tell, very cool. Tell well, us about the next level. We talked about the top 50, yeah, you, top 25%. Let's yeah. talk about the top 10. Top 10. All right. Top 10, 152,321. So if you're making 152,321 or above, you are in the top 10% of earners uh, in this country. And so at this level for me, when I got here, um, I did feel like I arrived. I did feel like um, I kind of figured some stuff out. Um, I've been shooting for that, you know, level over over a hundred thousand. And um, I, I think uh, for me is really this was the the moment for me where I started to take on some of the, you know, mentality that you had, Will, which is like, okay, I at this point I am not going to let my my expenses rise to meet my income level. I'm going to make sure that I save a little bit more. Now I wish that I saved more. I'm going to throw that out there. But this was when I really started to, to kind of pay attention for like, okay, um, once uh, I remember my very first car had roll-up windows. It was a, a Volkswagen GTI, and this thing was a, a hoopty. I know I'm dating myself, but a hoopty, you know, is, is, is a car that's just getting down the road. It squeaks. It has noises and creaks and cracks, um, but it had roll-up windows. And I remember um, my next car was a Ford Ranger that had power windows. And I remember saying, I'm not going back to roll up windows. And so I understand, you know, in life that a luxury once experienced, you know, does become a necessity going forward, which is what you explained, you know, with the guy with the $10,000 watch or the $100,000 watch. Look, a watch tells time just the same, you know, as a $10 watch versus, you know, $100,000 watch, right? It still tells time and it depends on if that's your thing or, you know, whatever watches really aren't my thing. Um, I'm happy with my, my Apple watch, but um, it, it, I understand, you know, the whole principle. So it was really at this level where I started kind of wanting to learn what to do with my money. Where should I save it? What's going to be best? Do I just, you know, follow, you know, what, what everyone's telling me? But again, this wasn't something that was sitting around my kitchen table and it wasn't something that I was really getting taught at school, um, in high school, college, whatever, making money, saving money and what to do with it just wasn't something there was. And I will say this, even saving money will in my life, with my circle of influence and, the, and my friends and people, saving money wasn't even a cool thing. And that's one of the things that I, I hope we get back to as a country is that saving money does become a cool thing because that is not a fundamental thing. Very few people these days are talking about 
you know, saving money and having lo lots of liquidity, right, to, to do things. So it was at that level that this is where I really started to paying attention to it. And I'm thankful, you know, that I did. Again, wish that I would have, you know, been able to be even more, you know, diligent than I was. But that's where I started uh, really paying attention for myself. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting that kind of like 152, I think as well, I probably felt a little bit like I had arrived. Um, but I built up the skills and kind of the character traits and developed these muscles along the way of saving, of still being very intentional with what I purchased. And so I still had that in place. It kind of became a game for me to see what I could do inside of that. And I think that intentionality, that discipline, those are important character traits to have. But the other thing that I recognized here is I had gotten really used to, you know, I, I was looking for functional, right? I was always looking for functional. I don't know if I was always looking for fun. And so I know when I got to this level, like I remember thinking, man, I have worked my butt off to get to this point, right? I had a pretty good wealth creation plan in place. I put in the work to kind of sustain that level of income and was actually improving that level of income. And I had worked really, really hard most of my really most of my life up to that point. And so the thing that took me probably longer to do than I would have, uh, you know, if I could go back and change it, I might change this, right? Which is like, I probably would have enjoyed the fruits of my labor a little bit more, right? I was still a little bit hesitant to go on the trips. What I've kind of done later on, especially as gotten to the top five and top 1% and all that stuff, like I look at the experiences. I look at the trips with my family. I relax a little bit more in my downtime. I enjoy my development and growth a little bit more because it doesn't feel like I have to rush as fast as possible to get these new skills and character traits so I can move to the next level and work super hard and do all that stuff. I can actually enjoy it. And more importantly, and Jim, I think everybody will resonate with this, and I know I think you will as well, I was able to really give back and pour into and be present with the people and the causes that I care about in my life. I help out with a nonprofit. I have incredible people inside of my life. And I was able to not only financially get back to that, but because I had that stability, because I had that kind of financial security, I was able to show up a whole lot better. And that's what I really noticed after that kind of 185,000 a year. That was what shifted for me. Hmm, very cool. Yeah, that's when it sounds like for you, that's what uh, that turning point between, you know, you know, rich and wealthy or having you know, an abundance or an excess above and beyond, you know, what it is that you need and your savings where you can start thinking about, okay, well, you know, this is money, you know, and this, this, you know, wealth or richness, if you will, is a resource for me. So that was a kind of a cool uh, distinction. I don't think that I really uh, got to that level until the, the, the next spot uh, for me, but definitely at the next spot is really when that, that happened. So um, let's jump into that for, um, for everybody. So the top 5%, is 220,521. So 22521. If you're making that as a household, you're in the top 5%. Households. That can be you and your household. Partner. How yes, households. Adjusted gross income for the household. 220,521. So for me, we, you know, at at this level is really when I started getting ultra serious about what to do uh, with money. I started um, getting better advice from my tax people, from my investment people, I started getting into different circles. But like you will, this was where I started having the ability to say, okay, I need to let go of some of this, some of this money as well. Um, again, had been working really hard, kind of felt like I arrived. But I here's what a big distinction for me was at this time. I'd busted my butt for a long time to make the first hundred thousand right a year. It didn't take me, and it probably took me a third as long to go from a hundred to two hundred. And so I started thinking at that, like, oh, what would it take to get to 500 or 600 or a million or like this, these next levels, right? And so started thinking, you know, along those lines, not knowing how to do it or figure it out and knew it was going to be look, look, you know, completely different. But at least I started thinking about it, you know, at that at that level. And um, I didn't stay at, at the top 5% level very long. I, I wanted to move past th that level. But I can remember feeling a sense of uh, arrival for me when I was able to give a, a large, you know, five-figure check to my church to uh, to go build a building. And I just remember that sense of like, man, it feels really, really good to be able to do this. I wonder what the next level, you know, is going to feel like. And so that was probably the the, the motivator for me um, that really kind of inspired me to want to work, you know, even harder and learn new skills and go through more challenges. Was that I had a little taste of, of, of this. And uh, again, it's top five percent, right? So feeling feeling pretty good. The bias wanted to wanted to quickly get to 
get to the next level. What was that like for you? You know, it was interesting as it kind of moved up through this, I, I would say in, in, you know, household now with my wife and my wife makes she's a trauma surgeon. She makes really good money as well. You know, we're, we're up in to what we'll reveal in a second, which is the top 1%. I didn't really, for me, notice that much difference from going from the top 5% to the top five, or excuse me, top 10% to the top 5% to the top 1%. And with one exception, I noticed, and you know, this is one of the things that we've talked about here and we had to prepare ourselves for, normally you and I don't talk about how much money we make, not because it's some big secret, but it's just, that's not the way that we were raised. But in order for us to be able to connect with you guys out there, to be able to share our stories and for us to really fulfill our mission of creating a stronger America, we kind of both had to get very, very open with this. And so the thing that I noticed as people realized I was making more money is it, I, I didn't really want to get treated differently, if that makes sense. Like I didn't want to get, you know, kind of like, uh, it weirded me out where people all of a sudden it was very much like sir, stuff like that. Like before where it's just like, you know, will or whatever it is. And you're just having a casual conversation with somebody like, I'll never forget. I went into Wells Fargo. I was working on, you know, I think it was, oh, I was opening up one of the previous companies at the time. And I had quite a bit of money sitting there and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm just dressed in, now I'm mostly, yeah, I dress decently these days, but back then it was a lot of t-shirts and stuff like that. And so he went in, it was, how can I help you? You know, what's going on? It was very casual. And then he looked at the accounts and everything became sir and this and that. And I was like, oh, this is a different experience. And I remember kind of walking out of there and going, you know, that's interesting. Why was that? Like, obviously I'm a valued customer to them and that's cool. But like what I noticed is it became a little bit, and like, why did it weird me out? It became a little harder for me to stay, or I just recognized like this could be harder for me to stay grounded, right? The principles that got me here, some of them don't apply anymore. Some of these things that I believe to be true are no longer, they're not true. And that's why I struggled to get through the stages. But there's other things like working hard, like treating people with respect, like looking to get back to the community, making sure you can be aware of what's going on around you and provide a helping hand wherever you need to. I think that was the key for me that I recognized. I was like, oh, this could go differently, right? If I let myself get caught up in this, this could go differently. And that was one thing I never wanted to do. I wanted to stay grounded. I wanted to remember what matters, what I stood for, what I believed in. And then the other real cool thing that I found along the way is I was able to take other people with me in my success, their success, me being successful because of the way that, especially with the businesses and partnerships and equity and all that stuff, it meant that they were able to be successful. They were able to build their wealth. And that became so cool for me. It was such a, like, um, I just felt alive with it. It was very cool. It didn't feel like a burden with all the hard work and all that stuff. It just felt kind of inclusive and like you were giving back. That, that was the biggest change for me, Jim. Yeah, it's really, really, really fun. I agree with you, man. And thanks for sharing that. That's it's way more fun to have to have other people uh, winning, and to be able to take people along uh, the ride. Which is why this podcast, you know, why, why we decided to even do this, right, is to give as, as much away as we possibly can, you know, for the benefit, you know, of other people. And so, man, that, that's really cool. All right, let me dig into the top one percent uh, because there's a lot to unpack here in the top one percent. Top one percent of earners in America is five hundred forty-eight thousand. 336 combined household income 548 so if you're making five hundred and forty eight thousand dollars as a household on your ta your tax returns you're in the top one percent uh in this uh in this country and so i can just remember um w when when i got there this is when um i really was conscious about where i'm going to be putting my money and what i'm going to be saving you know for a percentage rise i i it's kind of embarrassing to say it will but this at this level I was like, okay, um, now I'm I'm going to be 100% diligent to saving a specific um, and consistent percentage of what I'm making. I wanted to be able to give away what I wanted to give away. I wanted to be able to have um, my uh, my house and you know my lifestyle and all that stuff. But I was willing to at this point be really diligent about you know spending uh, my money on things that. I really didn't need to, to be spending my money on. Sure, I wanted nice things. 
Um, I still drive uh, the the um, you know the same truck that I I had when I was making actually in the the two hundred thousand range. So I didn't buy the hundred fifty thousand dollar you know vehicle because and I made those decisions. Not that's that that's good or bad. I just knew that the impact of that on what I was wanting to do with these resources was going to be serious. And so this is actually I had a um, a, a mentor of mine really step up and teach me the difference between price versus cost. And this is where I learned opportunity costs. This is where I first started learning learning about financial principles and having an understanding leverage and how money is, is really gonna work. And hopefully as we get into other episodes, we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of, of how great this stuff is when you you know know what you know. Like what you had said, sometimes you just don't know, right? There might be that blind spot or we might think that we know something to be true and it turns out you know not to be, right? And so this was at that level where I really started paying attention to that stuff. I really started reading more, started learning more, and started understanding the impact of taxation and wealth and markets and inflation and just all the nerdy stuff that you and I talk about all the time. Um, what to do, you know, with all that stuff. So this was um, this was a, the bigger turning point as I as I got up to there. And I and I'm not done. I want to make more so that I can do more, so I can give more. Um, you know, the rest of uh, rest of my life, I see uh, retirement very differently uh, th- than than others, right? So, um, but anyway, I don't know. What for you was there big distinctions when you got to this level that changed? It doesn't sound like as you went up. There was huge, you know, kind of aha, you know, kind of kind of moments. You still sound like you were very disciplined on your saving, very disciplined on, you know, being conscious, you know, of it. Felt a little different, you know, going into, you know, different, you know, banking situations and, and things of that nature. But now that once you've got from to this level, what uh, what did you notice? Well, I had a major life change when I got to this level, and that was my daughter was born. And so, when my daughter was born, all of the, it shifted my view of it. So before it was very much like it was, um, you know, it was safety, it was security, it was, you know, kind of a reflection of the hard work that I'd done up to that point. And everything shifted, right? I started looking at money less like a scarce resource and way more like a tool, right? And that's obviously, we talk a lot about that, but that's where I really started to get it, you know, not only working for me, which it had, it had been up to that point, but I shifted my view of it. And it became very much a tool where it could build upon itself to allow my family to have great experiences, right? We just got back from Mexico a couple of weeks ago. Didn't bat an eye at booking that trip, getting the flights, right? All inclusive, great kids club, amazing experience with my family. That money is a tool that we use to have an experience. It's not a scarce resource where save up, save up, save up. It's there. It exists. And I think when, you know, now as I look at it as a dad, as opposed to when it was just kind of me or even when my wife and I were, were, you know, married and a partnership and all that stuff, I'd shifted the entire way I look at it because now I'm thinking way beyond me, right? It's, it's my daughter. It's, it's the legacy there. And I think that was the biggest shift for me there is how to use it as a tool instead of looking at it as a scarce resource. Yep. Very cool. Well, I think that's probably a pretty good spot to wrap it up there, Jim. Any other last thoughts before we head out here? Ah, I think we I think we covered it. The only thing that I would say is that wherever you're at in your time in your life, and maybe you're making a heck of a whole lot more than the top 1% or maybe you're not there yet even at the top 50%, would just be to, you know, stay focused on getting to where it is that you want to go. Just because you're not there yet doesn't mean that you're not going to get there, right? But whatever it is for you, I would just say that there, um, stay focused on what you want to get and never stop learning, becoming more valuable, and moving up this ladder. Um, it's a good thing to move up this ladder, and it's a good thing to be saving money. Um, it's, we're going to make this cool again. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Guys, thank you for joining us today. America is the best country in the world. Knowledge is power, and our country is stronger with people armed with the knowledge of how the wealthiest citizens have created their personal wealth. So thank you for being a part of our movement to improve our country and become a wealthy American. If you got value from this, please like and subscribe. And if you're one of our audio-only listeners, if you took the two minutes to give us a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to this on, it would mean the world to us. And more importantly, it could be the thing that allows another person to change their financial future. Thanks. Thanks.